Hi everyone and welcome to the start of this series where we're going to do some focus chats and the idea behind this is that we're just going to sit down and talk about any particular topic. So what we're going to talk about today is Red S and I've got Mina here with me to chat about it and um, she's actually got some personal experience of Red S so I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. So maybe you can just start us off Mina and sort of what is Red S? I guess some people might be, I don't know, watching and it's the first time they've heard of it. Sure. So Red S is an acronym, it stands for Relative Energy Deficiency in Sport and it's evolved from the female athlete triad so the first time this was kind of defined as a thing if you like. Um, it was a bit more of a, a, a smaller spectrum that it took into account. And it's if effectively a, a kind of um, physical um, dysfunction that can arise in athletes quite commonly. So it used to be defined as the female athlete triad. It's now developed into Red S. And that's mainly just to include a bigger array of physiological symptoms and also to include men because it's not just about women. Yeah, so I guess it sort of started off, didn't it? As the female athlete triad, you can kind of view it as a triangle, couldn't you? You mm. sort of had like... Um, I guess you had menstrual dysfunction was yeah. like the big one, like bone density sort of impairment or whatever you'd call that. And I think it was just eating disorder, wasn't it? And I think that's another sort of development of Red S where I feel like the female athlete triad was quite sort of, I don't know, yeah, pinholed down that approach, uh, sort of yeah, avenue of like disordered eating. And Red S is not so much like that, is it? Um, well, I, I, the actual definition with the female athlete triad was energy was the third. Oh, um, so was energy it? Deficient. I think I've always seen it as sort of like yeah. disordered eating, which I guess, you know, it applies that sort of psychological element of it as exactly. well. Exactly. And I think often, in often cases with female athlete triad and with Red S, that can be a yeah. component of, of the disorder, but not necessarily. So you can have voluntary and involuntary Red S. So you might have this syndrome that is created through an eating disorder mm. and then it's kind of as a result of that you're in low energy availability which we'll talk about what that is um, or it could be involuntary due just to high training load and maybe uh, not enough attention on nutrition mm. or just not not quite eating yeah. enough. I guess it's quite nice isn't it in a way because it just sort of almost starts to break down some of those barriers when you have like this quite discreet set of like symptoms you sort of obviously exclude people like excluding men but there's also certain I feel like people have quite a lot of like barriers up around maybe like disordered eating or menstrual function you sort of need to really like have quite discreet symptoms and I feel like as we all know it's not really like that it's much more of a spectrum and mm. it seems like red s really sort of encapsulates that yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's much more of a spectrum, which in some ways makes it more difficult because it's quite hard to diagnose and it's quite mm. hard to pin down those symptoms as part of the umbrella of Red S. Um, but I think it is good because sometimes people would slip through the net otherwise mm. and there would be issues that, that wouldn't be picked up. So we think it's quite important to talk about it in climbing because it's a weight-dependent sport. Training is becoming way more common and there's kind of lots of juniors training quite hard lots mm. of people really pushing their grade whether they're juniors or adults and I think this is just a trap that we all have the potential to fall into yeah so we thought it was quite relevant um to talk about yeah I think you're right and I think also um as we'll, we will kind of get on to is that quite a lot of people are training now alongside quite a lot of other things mm. like a busy life commuting to work and yeah I think that I guess what I think is quite useful about I guess what we now talk term red s is that yeah it gives you that sort of yeah umbrella to cover all those different things that can be like a drain on our energy I guess in a way yeah definitely and um, so I guess leading on from that there's a sort of almost like we'd say like a theory behind red s so we're going to get on to talk about all these different symptoms and stuff but I guess it's called relative energy deficiency in sport so I guess what is that energy deficiency do you want sure. to sort of yeah, give us sure. a little overview of what that means so a term that gets used a lot is energy availability and that sounds a bit confusing because we think of energy balance don't we think of like what you eat and then what you expend and we are talking about those things but when we talk about energy availability we're talking about the amount of energy that's left over after exercise so if you look at your daily energy intake mm -hmm. and then you 
ignore the exercise, well not ignore the exercise, but take the exercise portion out of it and think about how much fuel you have left over from your dietary intake to support basic bodily functions. So mm -hmm. the things that your body needs energy for at rest. And that's what we're talking about, energy availability. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Red S, it's low energy availability. So you'll often see it shortened to LEA, and that's low energy availability. Because often what will happen, especially in involuntary Reds, is that people's exercise will be quite substantial mm -hmm. in terms of energy expenditure, and they'll be eating what potentially looks like a decent amount of food, but it's not quite enough to compensate for that exercise mm -hmm. expenditure. And what the body does is it will prioritize exercise so it will fuel the exercise mm. and then essentially your basal functions won't get the fuel yeah. they need. And eventually, chronically, that will start to downregulate certain um, functions, which is when where the symptoms then come yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's that sort of thing where, um, you know, probably great from an evolutionary standpoint, yeah. is that our bodies always prioritise movement because, you know, you always want to be able to move to get food or move away from danger. Um, and I guess... It's sort of the thing that takes the hit is all that energy needed to do everything else. And I think sometimes we do think that the food we eat is literally just for the training we do. But actually, like, all the adaptations that we want to take place, plus just using our brain throughout the day, like, all of these things also require energy. Mm. And, yeah, I think it's quite interesting when you start to think about the hormone downregulation that you mentioned and this is like something that gets talked about quite a lot with red s because like you said it's the sort of physiological sort of basis of where all the symptoms start to sort of come from and i think it's quite like a nice way of thinking about it is this sort of evolutionary standpoint because your body is really clever in having what i think of as this sort of communication system within and say we start with a certain number of building blocks and these are going to be used to do lots of things within our body. If we put our body under stress and we need to make a lot of cortisol, which is just one hormone, we essentially like withdraw resources from this sort of like top pool and then there's not as much left to be fed into the sort of pathway to produce estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, that's whether you're male or female. So essentially, it's the downregulation of all those that you get by sort of almost funneling all your resources down this kind of stress pathway, because I guess that's basically what you're putting your body under is stress by being in this low energy sort of state. Mm. And that um, central kind of governor that you spoke about is essentially your hypothalamus. So it's an area of yeah. your brain that controls a lot of different functions and hormone production pathways in your body. And it essentially goes, I don't have enough energy for this mm. because this person needs to run or climb or whatever that is. And so it starts to, to shut certain things down. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, it's like an energy saving mechanism, isn't it? Yeah, for it's your like putting body. your phone on uh, power save. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you dim the lights. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But that is kind of what it feels like. And I think the symptoms, and I guess this broad range of symptoms, maybe this is a good sort of time to introduce that. It is this reflection of this dimming down of the lights in your body. And so, you know, I guess I've sort of mentioned the sex hormones, which are maybe the basis for some of the symptoms we experience. Mm. Estrogen, progesterone and testosterone in a female and sort of testosterone in a male, as well as some male estrogen and I guess one of the sort of primary things we might start to notice here is that these hormones are actually quite responsible for us building muscle, mm -hmm. say, and adapting to training. So poor adaption to training is kind of like, I think up there, to be honest, with a symptom that a lot of people who are really in tune with their training might notice. Especially but, strength training and yeah. strength and power training, because with endurance training, there are some other pathways for adaptation that... Um, that maybe work a little bit differently mm. and are, are less um, less affected. But you do see, yeah, among other symptoms, a kind of lack of response or kind of plateauing in strength and power training or mm. a kind of inability to gain muscle. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people thinking that they're non-responders and perhaps some some more adequate fuel adequate fueling would be beneficial. And other kind of things, and this, these symptoms are what make it so hard to diagnose, right? Because it's like tiredness, mm. maybe frequent colds and coughs, injuries, um, people with red S might often present with low iron levels, say on a blood test, mm. um, 
la low or lack of libido, um, in men, reduced erectile function, in women, uh, loss of periods mm. or irregular periods. So less than nine periods a year would be considered um, a kind of dysfunctionally low level of periods. Yeah, yeah. Um, or you might end up with super long cycles, you know, beyond 35 day cycles um, and, and lots of fluctuation in your period or mm. they might also just go completely. That's a, a real red, red flag. And also then the bone density issues, which is one of the kind of, I think, saddest arms of the, mm. of the Red S um, function, because that's the hardest one to claw back from. Because um, yeah. hormones play a big part in our bone um, formation and metabolism. So bone density can suffer in the long run, and then you may see um, stress fractures in some mm. athletes. Yeah, and I guess that's, um, you do see that a lot in runners, you know, I guess, uh, you know, ballerinas and stuff, something, mm. you know, these sports where they are quite weight dependent and Red S or the female athlete triad have been quite like prominent in those sports. Mm. And I think one of the things that I find quite interesting, I think when people talk about bone density, I think they're often like, oh yeah, that's like, that's a female thing. Mm. But actually like, um, we obviously went to that conference that you organized with Nikki Key. And one of the pieces of research she showed was in male cyclists. Mm. So it's, it really is sort of across the board. I think, I think it, Females almost get a lot of the attention with this because we have the menstrual cycle and periods that are this marker, this kind of red flag that can be quite, I guess, in some cases, if you're not on a hormone or contraceptive, it's quite easy thing to monitor and mm. you know, potentially is a little bit harder for the, the male sex. And it's something where they might have to be a little bit more in tune with the things that you said, you know, like poor concentration at work, libido, like maybe a bit of a short fuse with your partner, <laughs> you know, like mm. um, reduced coordination. And I guess that's where like monitoring as a whole is really useful because it might be, you know, and like poor responses, frequent injuries that you feel like aren't necessarily related to your training load, stuff like that. Mm. I think that's where like monitoring and like body awareness and literacy as a whole really come in for for everyone I guess for you within your personal experience do you want to just like I don't know give an idea of like the performance things that you felt like looking back reflecting mm. that that did really impact your performance because I guess for most people that's probably what they almost feel most acutely yeah we've got these two different things like health and performance mm. and although they aren't completely um distinct from each other they're also not synonymous you know there's yeah. things that will affect your health that might not affect your performance especially in the short term mm. like actually when I had my diagnosis of red s it was probably when I was climbing at my best yeah um, which is kind of quite confusing to be told you're not 100% healthy mm. and when you're performing well and it's kind of hard to get your head around the idea that it's not healthy um I mean having said that with bone health it won't necessarily be when you're 60 that you experience the, the dysfunction. You yeah. can, you know, have a diagnosis and be getting stress fractures um, in and around that time. So it is definitely a, a kind of shorter to medium term um, mm. issue as well as a long term issue. But yeah, in terms of performance, I mean, there was some recent research suggesting that hemoglobin mass goes down by something like mm. 8%. So, you know, in terms of your fitness and your, your CV, uh, circulatory fitness, um, that can be really affected in Red S. Um, the strength gains that we talked about mm. earlier, concentration, you know, we're such a cerebral sport and like problem solving and all that kind of stuff. Um, fatigue. Yeah. And I think fatigue's a really difficult one, right? And I personally found that I was really tired. And now that I'm fully recovered, I look back at that tiredness. Mm. I go, yeah, that was abnormal. You're not but having time, like eight coffees a day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was propping up the coffee a lot. A lot of people around me seem to be doing the same. Mm. And it's very hard, you know, is my tiredness different from your tiredness? Mm. What's the, it's very subjective, isn't it? Yeah. So it's easy to normalize, I think, things that perhaps aren't completely normal. Mm. Uh, sleep disruption can be quite a thing as well, which will then have an impact on yeah, performance. Yeah, on your performance and coordination. I mean, like a few nights bad sleep they've shown to have like a mm. massive um, effect on that sort of like, you know, the time for your responses and stuff, which, you know, for climbing is a big part. Mm. Yeah, so I guess it's just that sort of real emphasis on the fact that even if you feel like your health is not being impacted right now, mm. actually you might not be making the performance gains you could be making if you were in better energy availability. Because I guess that's the thing is often we look at how we are right now and we think just how you said, you're like, I'm performing pretty well right now. Mm. <laughs> um, 
but it's whether that's sustainable yeah, or exactly. not. Yeah, and whether you could be performing better in a parallel, mm. in a parallel pathway. It's a difficult one, but it can be true in a lot of cases, but it's not it's not um, necessarily going to be true. Mm. So if you have someone with a super low BMI, and we all know that BMI isn't a great measure within athletes because it doesn't really take into account lean mass, but if we're looking at that scale, you know, if you have someone who has a really low body fat percentage, they might be more at risk. Mm. But there's also this huge genetic factor, right? So some people will naturally sit at a very low body fat percentage and they will be perfectly healthy there. Mm. I, there's a, there's a definitely probably a cutoff where it becomes unhealthy and that's why we have certain um, within sport and a lot of different federations across different sports have kind of cutoffs for competition. Mm. Um, that is really to protect the health of the athletes. Yeah. But within kind of a healthy range, there's a lot of genetic variability. And so you can also get people who end up in low energy availability with quite a lot of metabolic and hormonal dysfunction who wouldn't be classed as underweight. And I certainly was in that category. Mm. I was very lean, but I wasn't technically in a kind of worrying underweight yeah, state. Yeah, yeah, you didn't sort of like walk into the doctor's office and they're not like, whoa, which no, is maybe absolutely. sort of part of the problem with detecting this within yeah, people. Yeah, absolutely. And actually long-term um, red S is associated more with um, negative body composition outcomes mm. because the more you end up in that chronic low energy availability state, the more you get down regulation of all sorts of things as we've talked about, but part of that is metabolic kind of suppression. Mm. So your body down regulates all these basal functions, which means that at rest, you're actually expending less energy because you're in this power saving mode. Yeah, yeah. And so over time, your body is basically fighting to get back to a set point. So you might find, and I found that over a few years, you know, I, I used to kind of sit quite comfortably at X weight and then it got harder and harder to to stay within that kind of range. It was almost mm. like, wow, if I want to be where I used to sit quite comfortably, I would have to be on some aggressive diet. Yeah. Um, my weight just gradually would would go up, um, probably because that initial weight was just a bit light for my genetics, yeah, even yeah. though it wasn't technically underweight. I suppose it's all that thing, isn't it, that our body really, as much as we try and try <laughs> to sort of push ourselves to extremes, it generally wants to sit in this sort of like homeostasis sort of window mm. that we like we work within and I think that will shift over time yeah I think we sort of have this idea that we can fight to fight to a lower weight but actually all we do is slightly shift that window that we can operate within to a slightly sort of reduced metabolic function which is actually potentially a slightly higher weight and I guess that's just where it's nice to be well for all of us climbers uh, coaches parents be aware of this because the earlier you catch that you know, mm. you maybe start to see that shift. I guess that's the point at where you can like have a look at what's going on. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think it's really important to point out that although we are a weight sensitive sport, we're a strength to weight sensitive mm. sport, really. Like what we want is a good strength to weight ratio because we're lifting our bodies. Mm. That doesn't necessarily need to occur at your lightest weight. And yeah. I think often climbers try to manipulate the weight part of that ratio without thinking about the strength part. Mm. So as a, you might be a healthier, more sustainable athlete with more strength and power because of all the hormonal adaptations we've mm. talked about being more accessible to you yeah. at a higher weight. I know, I always actually find it quite funny, say when I think about my own training. So you obviously organised that um, sort of Red S conference with mm. uh, Nikki and Rini, which was really great. And they sort of, um, as a, a general guideline, they obviously work with athletes who do want to drop a bit of weight, maybe for competitions or something like that. Anyway, they talked about really this quite small sort of window of weight loss that they said was healthy. Mm. Say that was right. I can't, I don't want to take words out of their mouth. Say that was about two kilos, mm. I think they said. So you don't really want to go beyond that. If we do like sort of a few cycles of strength training, you think how quickly you can add two kilos to your fingerboard mm. weight or to your max pull-ups. It does sort of break down this notion of like, you see that it's actually, it's quite a small gain in performance you can get via weight. Mm. And I think that it's actually quite a large gain in performance that we can get via training. So yeah, I'm completely with you. I think that having that like sort of emphasizing that that is really where there's most to be gained in a sustainable way is really good. Mm. And there's also certain, within the dietary aspect of that, there's certain 
um, dietary patterns or habits that mm. might make people, some people, maybe not everyone, more susceptible mm. to this kind of issue like um, chronic low carbohydrate, which the research at the moment wouldn't suggest is, is going to be like the best thing for an athlete anyway, mm. but it's quite popular in general media. Um, but carbohydrate plays quite a big role in hormonal health and function. So um, there's a fair bit of research showing that low carbohydrate availability mm. in conjunction with or potentially not in conjunction with mm. low energy availability can affect hormonal health and function as well and we also have a lot of things going around you know to do with intermittent fasting or alternate day fasting and things like that and again limited research but there is some research of on within day energy availability which showed um more menstrual dysfunction in groups that had longer um periods of fasting within the day so there's there's lots of different things that mm. kind of go into the melting pot for this kind of issue yeah so i guess that's like sort of brings us quite nicely onto this sort of like, okay, we've talked a lot about Red S, how do we actually reduce our risk of this? And I guess that was a really good starting point of being like, well, these are all the broad range of like symptoms. This is how you might have got there. So if you are experiencing those symptoms, I guess then you can start to look at like what the sort of root cause of them might be mm. for you. And I think that this is where just that general monitoring of how you are feeling and I guess with what we've talked about with tracking of the menstrual cycle I think this is where that's a really great tool because mm. if you can see what is changing for you and this doesn't have to just be like cycle length um you know I think people often talk about that like missed periods and stuff but it also could be a change in your period for you like mm. your flow or your number of days um even maybe symptoms that come with it and you know I guess for those that don't menstruate that just monitoring of like yeah like you said your fatigue your energy levels your concentration maybe how often you're getting ill or injuries alongside your training is really like valuable and I think the step before that almost you know when you peel away these layers is actually being sort of body literate and aware that you're even experiencing those because as you said it's quite easy to normalize how you are feeling because I guess things that we're talking about today it's not like a switch you know it's not like one day you are completely hormonally mm. healthy and the next day you're this sort of chronic sufferer of red s it really is this spectrum over time so for for those that do menstruate it's probably not that they just lose their period overnight and don't have it for a year it's mm. probably that they become less frequent, they become lighter, and then maybe, you know, maybe then eventually that does become, um, like, quite a chronic um, issue. I guess when we talk a lot about this more, like, menstrual health stuff, maybe monitoring your period, what it's like, all the symptoms, like, I feel like some people could be a little bit like, ugh, I don't want to do that, or they don't want to talk about it. And, you know, I know that you've been really good at sort of speaking quite openly about your experience which you know mm. you didn't have to and so I guess what would you say to people who are thinking that whether they're people who menstruate or whether they're they're not you know if they sort of find the idea of talking about this hard yeah it, it is difficult you know it has a, a history of being quite taboo to talk mm. about menstruation periods things like that and also to talk about the mistakes we've made as human beings you know mm. I find it quite hard to admit um you know and, and like you said I I had the option to keep it quite quiet and, and I decided not to because I thought it was really important and I thought it was probably something that was more prevalent in climbers and when I had my diagnosis I went to other sports to find information because there's mm -hmm. quite a lot written about runners, swimmers, cyclists and I found nothing in climbing but when I understood more what was going on for me I realised that it must be pretty prevalent in climbing yeah. and I was like huh no one's talking about this so you know I decided that a little bit of awareness can go a long way and mm. I think awareness and you know trying not to be too embarrassed about talking to things that talking about things that happen to a lot of people mm. you know a lot of us make mistakes in general in life in all sorts of areas <laughs> yeah. of our lives a lot of us make mistakes with nutrition despite knowing about nutrition mm. a lot of us make mistakes about exercise despite knowing a lot about training yeah um and yeah so it's it's one of those things I think education awareness and a bit of compassion between everyone in the community. I think that's a really nice uh, place to, to wrap up, isn't mm. it? That, um, you know, really foc big focus on awareness and communication. 
And if along the line you want any more information about Red S, there is a, an IOC, which is International Olympic Committee, consensus statement on relative energy deficiency in sport that was published in 2014. There was also a 2018 update. Um, so that's a good place to, to go and start if you want more information. Yeah, and we'll just put another couple of links in the show notes um, to some sort of ideas behind communication. I guess that's where we've really wrapped this up. And there's a few out there for coaches, but also for parents. There's actually this, especially for maybe dads and, you know, I guess male it's very male dominant, the sort of coaching world in climbing. Mm. And as much as this Red S very much like sort of is for everyone i think the conversation around menstrual dysfunction is a really important sort of element of this so we'll put that in the show notes too